Friends, I want to encourage you, please, to turn with me in your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 2. We're going to find our way there to our text in just a few moments. 1 Peter chapter 2. Before I do, can I just take a moment um, and acknowledge that in worship, we are mindful of all that is good and right and holy and beautiful in this world. In worship, we are mindful of all the ways that God brings beauty out of brutality. But we can't fully appreciate the degree to which God brings beauty out of brutality until we confess in the midst of worship that we live in a world brutalized by violence, hate, terrorism, war. And I just want to take a moment to offer a prayer for the turmoil all through the Middle East. The language that we use is about Israel and Palestine, but there are neighboring countries and peoples all around the center of conflict that are impacted just as those in the center of the conflict. And I wonder if we might just take a moment and offer a prayer for the Prince of Peace to reign in that region of the world as he reigns in our hearts as well. Would you pray with me? Lord, we recognize that our worship is incomplete if it is only celebrating that which is good and beautiful and perfect. It is only complete when we confess to you and lament before you that this world continues to be broken and brutalized by hatred and sin. Our prayer in this hour of worship is that you, the reigning prince of peace, would bring peace where there is conflict. We pray that our sisters and brothers in faith in the regions most talked about in these recent days would be the visible presence of the risen Christ, the visible presence of the Prince of Peace. And we pray that even as we worship and we, we seek to be transformed by you, we pray that you would transform us so that we might know what our role is in being the evidence of your risen self in this world. We pray that you would speak to us this day, even as you bring peace and comfort and stability where the world has gone mad, even in places within our own hearts in this room where our own worlds have gone mad. Speak to us, Lord. And transform us even now. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now friends, I want to uh, call your attention to First Peter. But before we do, I need, to, I need to tell you about something that happened many, many years ago when I was not as old and experienced and wise as I am in my younger and more vulnerable days. Uh, I, re I said to my, my wife years ago, let's go out to eat. We went out to eat to, at a restaurant. Trouble is, we didn't have much money, Monty. And by we didn't have much money, I, we didn't have money. <laughs> and we decided we're going to splurge anyway and go to this nice restaurant. It was beautiful. It looked great. It was on a lake. It had a beautiful setting. It was an Italian restaurant. Let's go eat Italian. I knew there was a problem the moment we walked into the restaurant. And uh, it was almost like the needle scratches off the record, you know, that sound, because everyone was so well-dressed, linen tablecloths. We sat down, and they, they handed us a menu, and my wife's menu didn't have any prices on it. You see what I'm talking about? And we recognized we were in trouble. And, and then after the server carefully placed our linen napkins on our laps for us, I leaned over to Laura and I said, we can't afford this. <laughs> and she leaned back to me and said, I know, what do we do? And I said, follow my lead. I said, I want you to call my cell phone. She said, what? I said, call, my woman, don't question me in the midst of crisis. Call my cell phone. She called my cell phone. It was a flip phone. And I set the ringer on loud, 
and I let it ring like two or three times as if I didn't hear it so that everyone else could hear it. And Oh, is that me? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Hello? <gasps> what? <laughs> no. Excuse me just a minute. And I leave the restaurant and I go outside where you can still see on the porch through the glass window as I put on an Academy Award winning performance. What? No. And I come back in and I go to the table where my wife is and the server is waiting. And I said, I'm sorry, there's been an emergency. We have to leave. Laura gathered her things. I reached in my pocket and brought out two $1 bills for your trouble. We get in the car and we crack up on the way home. We did not belong in that place. We cracked up and she said, just out of curiosity, what was the emergency? I said, the emergency is we broke. We, we broke. That's the emergency. And we knew in that moment we did not belong in that spot. We were so out of place. Man, we were out of place. And I say that to you and I tell you that story because that is how so many people feel when they walk into a church for the first time. They walk in and they, and they give it a chance. They give it a shot. They walk in they, and then they look around and they see the exterior projections of other people's lives and they compare the exterior projection of their lives to the interior reality of their own lives and they say, I don't, I don't know if I belong here. I feel so out of place here. And maybe that's you today. Maybe by some miracle of God's grace, you found yourself here today. But every time you've ever gone to church, you've always felt as if, man, I don't know if this is, this is me. There's something in me that doesn't fit here. And maybe you know because of the thing you carry around in secret within your own life and your own life story, that you assume nobody else has that same secret and that same burden that they carry around and you walk in and say, I just don't know if I belong here. And that's why this sermon today is for you. Because we're in a brand new series, as you can tell, called 6910. And we're asking ourselves these many weeks to, together, what does it mean to be the church at this address? 6910 McGinnis Ferry Road. What does it mean to be the visible presence of the risen Christ at this address. So today, I, I just want to simply entitle the message that God has placed upon my heart for you. I want to entitle it, Trust Me, You Really Do Belong Here. Trust Me, You Really Do Belong Here. In the New Testament, there are so many images and metaphors that are used to describe what it means to be the church. So many word pictures that are used to describe to be what it means to be the church. Like in some places we talk about being a body, the body of Christ. In other places we talk about being branches, abiding in a vine. Some places we hear ourselves described as the church as the bride of Christ. We're described as salt in the world, light in the world, a city on a hill. We're described as a family of faith. So many beautiful metaphors to describe what it means to be us. There's one more that I want us to focus on today, and it's found in this passage in 1 Peter chapter 2. Will you read it with me? Listen to these words. As you come to him, that's, that's Jesus, as you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in Scripture it says, see, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now, to you who believe this, the stone is precious, but to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. And the stone that causes people to stumble in a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. But, but, but you, 
You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. The image I want to hold up before us as we worship today about what it means to be at 6910, what it means to be built as the church of the living Christ, the dominant image in this passage is simply this, a spiritual house built with rejected stones. That's what the church is intended to be, a spiritual house, but built with rejected stones. You know that the most important stone on the house, especially in ancient architecture, was the cornerstone. Before there was a, uh, an opportunity to create footers and foundations made of rebar like we do today, the cornerstone was the most important stone of the whole structure. It was expertly chosen. It was perfectly chiseled. It was hewn to a to a perfect shape that allowed every side of that infrastructure to be set in alignment with the cornerstone. It held the whole thing together. I think we have a picture of it. We did? Oh, it's behind me. Okay. Sometimes I got to look behind me. Sometimes I got to watch these people behind me. You never know. The cornerstone holds the whole thing together because the cornerstone is what sets the other stones in alignment with itself. So Jesus all through scripture is described as the chief cornerstone because he is the one by which we are to set our lives in alignment with his. We order our life in alignment with the life of Jesus. And in that alignment, our house stands firm, but if out of alignment only a little, the house is threatened. Do you remember at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, after three long chapters we read in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, of the most excellent sermon ever delivered, the highest ethical standard ever spoken before humankind, Jesus holds up what it means to live a life of true, authentic righteousness before God. And at the end of that three-chapter sermon, he says, if you hear these words of mine and act on them, if you live them out, if you actualize what you've heard me talking about, then you'll be like a, well, like a man who built a house on the rock, on the stone on the foundation, because then when the rains fall and the floods rise and the winds beat and blow against your house, it will stand because it's been built upon the rock. But if you hear these words of mine, but you don't act on them, if you hear these words of mine, but don't actualize them, if you hear these words and you don't align your life into alignment with me, then you'll be like the man who built a house on sand and the rains fell and the floods rose and the winds blew and beat against the house and mighty was its fall because it was built on the sand. And I want to, I want to say out loud before the universe here today, many churches rise and fall all the time because they have set their foundation upon sand. You know, it's possible to set the foundation of your church upon shifting sand, upon the sand of cultural trends, upon the shifting sand of social fads. Well, this seems to work for this other church. Let's try some of that over here. By setting the cornerstone or the foundation of our, of our church upon the sands of political affiliation. And you know what we do? 
in churches all over America, both churches that lean to the right and churches that lean to the left, we are guilty of, the tempt- of giving in to the temptation of building out the ethics and the values and the, the way of this church upon a particular political platform. Have you seen it done? And yet the, the sinister trouble with this is that what we do, whether on the right or on the left, is that we find a position, a party, a politic, a person that on plank number three and four of their platform, that looks really Jesus-y. And so we choose to align the, the purposes of the church upon that person because it looks kind of Jesus-y. We do that on the right and we do that on the left. If we just align the ethics of this church upon identity politics and we virtue signal to make sure that everybody outside these walls of 6910 knows that we stand for this and we stand against that, well then suddenly we look up and recognize that what we thought was Christ, the cornerstone, is more like a cornerstone that is Christian-ish more than anything else. It's easy to be Christian-ish. And if you build your house upon a foundation that is Christian-ish, all it takes is for that cornerstone to be just two or three degrees off plumb. And in time, the whole house could fall. And I say that to you, beloved sisters and brothers, because at 6910, we have always and will always set the building of this spiritual house upon nothing more than, nothing less than, and nothing other than Christ, the sure cornerstone, the the firm foundation. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ, the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All of the ground is sinking sand. So in order for us to understand this image of the house being a spiritual house, the home address of God's presence on earth, the spiritual house among us, we understand that it's built upon the cornerstone. But the irony of this image is that it's a cornerstone that has been thrown away. A cornerstone that was rejected by expert builders and tossed into the heap. In the scriptures, Jesus is rejected by humankind, rejected and hated by mortals, tossed away. You know that in the book of Acts, we read how how, uh, Peter and James, they're preaching and they're arrested because they're preaching and they, they stand before the Sanhedrin, the highest court in the land and they're making defense and, and they're saying, you know, you had him crucified and the one you had crucified God has raised him up and we have seen him with our eyes and we have heard him with our ears and we have touched him with our own hands. And then this wonderful line from chapter four, Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the chief cornerstone. I don't think we could possibly comprehend fully the power of this image that we are being built up in a spiritual house until we recognize the level of rejectedness of the cornerstone itself, despised, hated, thrown away. Jesus was rejected by the very ones who we would expect to embrace him the most. Do you know that the saddest two verses in scripture, the saddest two verses in all the Bible for me come in John chapter one, listen to these words. He was in the world and the world came into being through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to those who were his own, and his own knew him not. I don't think we can understand the power of what it means to be built into a spiritual house upon a thrown away cornerstone until we recognize just how thrown away Jesus was. Do you know that Jesus was rejected for his teaching, his questioning, his questioning of authority, 
his reinterpretation of all the old orthodoxies that had led them that far. I came not to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. He spoke with an authority that didn't sound like anybody else, and it threatened them. Have you ever been in a situation where someone hears the same good news, but they hear it turn slant? They hear it in a way they hadn't heard it before, and so it sounds like it's foreign to them. It sounds as if it's heresy to them, and he was charged with being a heretic, and he was rejected because of what he had to say. Jesus was rejected for preaching that the kingdom of God This realm, this domain of God was not defined by political boundaries. It wasn't defined by ethnic boundaries. It wasn't defined by cultural boundaries. He was rejected for suggesting that the way to succeed is to fail. The way to win is to lose. The way to be great is to be small. He was rejected because he suggested that the best way to love is to demonstrate not love for your neighbors. That's easy. But to demonstrate love for your enemies and to pray for those who persecute you. He was rejected for preaching that the love of God was not limited to the few who assumed they were on the inside, but they They were actually rejecting him because he preached that the love of God was to be poured out on all those who were ever told they were on the outside. Jesus was rejected for looking into the face of the rejected ones and saying to them, trust me, you really do belong here. Because this is how God builds God's spiritual house with the building material of rejected lives. That's how God does it. I mean, why would God use a cornerstone that was thrown away and choose to build a new spiritual house out of something that had been thrown away? Because God knows that everyone who would come to the spiritual house at one time or another has been thrown away. And if the purpose of the cornerstone is to set the alignment for all the other stones in the house, and if all the other stones are our lives, then God understands all of us at one time or another are thrown away, broken, jagged edges, tossed out in the yard, into the trash heap. So what better and more beautiful way to build a new spiritual house of the broken than to bring the broken one himself as the chief cornerstone? You see, what we're talking about here is not simply that God builds a spiritual house out of Jesus. I mean, you'd expect that. What you don't expect is that you and I are the building materials as well. Did you hear the first couple of verses that we read? Listen to them again. As you come to him, Jesus, the living stone, rejected by humans, but chosen by God, precious to him, you also like living stones are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, clearing or offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Did you catch the most important two words of that entire passage? You also. I mean, it's not surprising to think that God would use Jesus, that he is the living stone. That seems to make sense. It's not surprising that God would even take this living stone of Jesus who was rejected and set it up as the foundation, the cornerstone of of the, the living spiritual home that he's building. What is surprising is that he would use us too. That just as he was the living stone who had been thrown away, you also are living stones. And everybody in this room knows what it means to have been thrown away at some time. Everybody in this room knows what it means to have passed your peak, to have been overlooked, passed by, thrown away, dismissed, invisible to somebody somewhere that you hoped to have been seen by. All of us, at some point or another, bring rejection into this house. And it occurs to me that what you typically do and I typically do when we come to church is we bring only the polished up stones of our lives. Look how shiny my 
the stone of my life is. Look how perfect it is, how, how, how finely crafted it is. Look how good we look. We're just, and yet, that's not how God builds a spiritual house. God builds only out of the broken stones, rejected stones that have the jagged edges that are not fun to look at and that you and I assume are worthless now. See, when I, when I, I want you to think about 6910 these days, I want you to think about it in this way. When it comes to building the spiritual house of faith here at 6910, we can't do it without him but he won't do it without us. Can you let that marinate for just a moment? We can't do it without him. He's the cornerstone, but he won't do it without us. And why? Because when Christ comes to set the foundation of a spiritual house, it is to be built up of broken people who are imperfect and unfinished and who have some shame and some scar tissue and some problems in their lives so that when everybody outside of 6910 looks at this place, they don't see how beautiful it is. They don't assume, look how beautiful the people are, how perfect their lives are. Oh, they're flawless. They've never made a mistake. Instead, they say, that's a place where I can go to because those people have been broken like me, and God is doing something with their lives. Amen. See, I was 10 years old. Can I just testify for just a minute? I was 10 years old when I accepted Jesus as the Lord of my life. And at the time, that was easy. I mean, my childhood had what a lot of your childhoods may have had. There was some brokenness and some pain, some injury, some trauma, some fear, some shame. There's all that stuff that's in your life too. Or maybe it's just me. Did I say that out loud? I had all that. And at 10, at 10, when I heard that there was a person in Jesus who was the face of God, and this God wanted to save me from that and rescue me and protect me and heal me in the wounded places and guide me well that was easy well sign me up let's go it wasn't hard for me to believe what Jesus could do with me but 42 years after that day what's hard to believe is not what Jesus can do with me and for me it's hard to believe what Jesus wants to do through me 42 years later of walking with Jesus, he has proven himself again and again and again. He could do anything for me. He's done it. It's easy to believe in Jesus. It's hard to believe in me. How about you? Anybody know what I'm talking about? Because you recognize, oh yeah, well, we'll be the spiritual house because Jesus does that kind of thing. He's perfect. He's holy. He was rejected, but God raised him up. I believe in Jesus. That's easy to believe what Jesus can do. I just don't believe that Jesus can do it with me because I know my patterns and I know my brokenness. I know where I have broken things and I know where I have been broken. I know my sin. I know my fear. I know my anger. I know my shame. And I'm just assuming that God may use other people whose exterior looks far better than my interior, but he can't use me. And I say to you, trust me, you belong here. Trust me because God's building material is broken lives. That's the only thing God chooses to use when God makes anything worth making. God chooses to use the rejected parts of our lives, the broken and jagged edges of our lives. Otherwise, we might stand back and look at how polished it has become and assume that we are responsible for its building. Yeah. Do you know what has taught me this? The 15th century, there was a bishop who got approval to rebuild a part of the cathedral with marble, Carrara marble, beautiful marble from Carrara, Italy. And he began the project, and it was gorgeous, the floor, the columns, the walls, absolutely beautiful. So then he assumes or he acquires the work of an artisan. He hires a sculptor and says, make us a statue out of this piece of marble. This statue was begun and. And then he failed. He just finished. He, I can't finish it. I can't do anything with this marble. 
And so he leaves it there, this one artist. And it stays in the courtyard of this cathedral for decades, a giant piece of unused and unusable marble, a big rock, a big stone. In fact, they nicknamed it the giant. It's just an eyesore, grass growing up all around it, people walking around, graffiti. I don't know if there was really graffiti, but I I see it in my head. And, And then the bishop hires a new young sculptor by the name of Michelangelo. Works on it a bit, chips away some things, polishes, sands away at some things. And now in Florence, Italy, we have the masterpiece, the David. A masterpiece that has such exquisite detail that it baffles the imagination that someone could take a stone that was so unusable and turn it into something so beautiful. So he was asked about it. How did you do it? How do you make something so beautiful out of something that was so ugly? And this is what he said. It's easy. You just tip away the parts that don't look like David. (laughs) Isn't that great? You just tip away the parts that don't look like David. He's in there. And then later on, later on, I just love that. You just chip away. It's in there. Don't you see it, right? Later on in a longer interview, this is what he said. In every block of marble, I see a statue as plain as though it stood before me shaped and perfect in attitude and action. I have only to hew away the rough walls that imprison the lovely apparition to reveal it to the other eyes as mine see it. And that is what God does with us. We look and see that all we have are the thrown away parts of our lives, the broken jagged edges that no one can do a thing with. And you know what? We can't. But in the hands of the great sculptor himself, in the hands of our Lord, he's able to to chip away and sand down and polish until the masterpiece that he had in mind in the beginning is revealed. It had been there the whole time, but it took the hand of a master craftsman who only works with broken materials. So bring your broken materials here, beloved. At 6910, may we be known in this community and in this world, not for that beautiful church that looks so wonderful and not for those perfect people who are so successful and flawless, but may we be known as the one place broken people feel free to come because here together, God is chipping away and sanding down and polishing up all of us. We are unfinished people, un imperfect people with unfinished stories so all of this leads toward the one day when we're able to live into and up to what we read in Ephesians chapter 2 consequently you are no longer foreigners and aliens but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. That's what's happening here. I don't know if you know it, but at 6910, every time we show up, that's what's happening. We are being built together into a spiritual temple temple where the the holy one himself abides and dwells with us out of broken people imperfect stories unfinished scripts and yet trust me you really do belong here it might be that even today you're hearing these words and maybe for the very first time you hear it in a way like you haven't heard it before And you recognize that that broken, thrown away piece of marble is you. And and you desire nothing more than to be made into something beautiful. And I'm here to tell you that in the hands of Christ, you can be. You can build your house upon the foundation of Christ. But it requires humility. It requires coming to a place where you submit to the love of God. And maybe offer a prayer like this right now God I stop right now trying to project whatever I think is more marketable in this world I stop right now and I confess to you that I've done that so so long and for 
for so many years. And I've attempted to project into the world something that is not in need of salvation, but is perfectly fine on its own. But I confess to you here and now that I've been wrong. I've been building my own house upon sand. But not anymore. I confess that you are the only true and certain foundation upon which my life can be built. And so I yield it to you. And I pray that you would forgive me for my sins. I pray that you would forgive me for the places in this world where I have broken things. And I pray that you would heal me in the places where this world has broken me. And I will, with sisters and brothers here, allow you to build me into a spiritual house for you. I pray that in your holy name. Amen. Friends, maybe you prayed that prayer just now or something that sounded like that prayer. And, and, and even if you didn't have the words to offer it, maybe that's the intent of your heart, that you, you're tired of playing games and, and you want to be a part of a church family that recognizes we're all being worked on. We're all being built together into some spiritual home for the presence of Christ. If that's you today. I pray that you would tell somebody about that. That's why our pastors are coming to the front of the sanctuary now to receive you and to to pray with you, to talk with you, to listen to you. And at the end of our benediction, as soon as we dismiss, they will remain right here, ready for you to come and speak with them. If you are giving your life to Jesus for the first time, come and talk. We'll tell you what your next step needs to be. If you've given your life to Christ, but you don't know what to do with it now, come and talk to us. Maybe he's calling you to be a part of this spiritual house and join the membership of our congregation and become part of what God is doing here at 6910. Maybe it's time for somebody to step into the waters of baptism and declare to the world that you too are the beloved of God. Whatever the decision may be, I pray that you don't wait another week that you come today. But for now, it's time for us to do really what we've come to do. To depart into this world having been transformed by the love in this place. By the love of God. So that we live outside of 6910 as if we actually believe everything we affirm here at 6910. So as you're able... Would you stand to your feet for the benediction? And you may wish to hold a hand next to you as I offer these words of blessing over us all. Wherever it is that you go from this place, may Christ go before you to prepare your way. May Christ go behind you on the days that you fear and feel like retreating to encourage you one step further at a time. May Christ go to your right and Christ to your left, abiding closer than even a sister or a brother. May Christ go above you on the days when you hear dark clouds rolling in to remind you that there is one above the clouds who at the end of the day has the final word. May Christ go beneath you, girding you with confidence and removing all forms of fear. But mostly may Christ go in you, transforming you from the inside out until your hearts beat in rhythm with his.